Welcome to your Health on Tech. I'm Dr. John White, the Chief Medical Officer at WebMD. Two million people are diagnosed with cancer each year. And you might be wondering, how is health tech helping to find cancer earlier? Because if we diagnose cancer at earlier stages, it usually results in a much better outcome. Have you been hearing about these new blood tests? These tests, often referred to as liquid biopsies, aim to identify cancer-related changes in the blood that can indicate the presence of cancer or monitor its progression. Then there's also other tests like 23andMe that look for genetic mutations that might increase your risk of certain cancers by analyzing your sputum. How do you know which one to take? And when you get the results, how do you know you're interpreting them correctly? Joining me to talk about some of the latest innovations in cancer detection is Dr. Sanjay Juneja. He is Chief of Oncology at Baton Rouge General Hospital, Mary Bird Perkins Cancer Center, and co-founder of Med Influencers. Dr. Juneja, thanks for joining me. Thank you. And thank you for having me. This is a very interesting topic that I think a lot of people are very you know, curious about when it comes to something so scary. Yeah. We often haven't heard in the past about a simple blood test that can detect cancer. So I'd like to start off with, can you explain what these liquid biopsy tests are and what they do? Sure. So these liquid biopsies, like you said, on seeing if someone has cancer, it's important to realize you're getting that to see if you have an active cancer, not if you have a risk for cancer, or if you need you know, tighter screening, you're actually seeing, is there a cancer cell in your body or a population of cancer cells? And can you get evidence of that by getting a blood sample? The same way you get a CBC, right? Complete blood mm-hmm. count or chemistry. Imagine if one of those polls is to say, hey, we're going to screen you for 50 to 60 cancers. And the word screen is tricky because you're not like you're seeing if there's an active malignancy or cancer. How are you doing that? Traditionally, we're looking at imaging, right? So we are getting a mammogram or we're getting a CT scan for lung cancer, or we're visualizing it with a colonoscopy and looking for that mass. Mm -hmm. But these are all different ways to to see it in um, in a manner where the mass is big enough to see it. And so on CT scans, it can take 100, you know, 300 million cells in one place to see it on a CT scan. You can't see it if it's 100,000. So as you very appropriately said, the best way to cure a cancer is ideally to take it out when it's early. So when you're getting this blood sample, you're hoping to catch it early and you're doing it by looking at the DNA of cells, uh, both your healthy cells. There's no way to differentiate if it's your healthy cells or a cancer cell. But we know what the DNA of a lot of common cancers, what those mutations are. And those will not be in the DNA of your healthy cells. So if you see a match and you're like, oh, my goodness, these, you know, X, Y, Z is what we see with colon cancer and really only with colon cancer. That's where this liquid biopsy says it looks like you may have an active colon cancer. Now, who are these tests for? Because in screening tests, we often base that on age or family history. Uh, We haven't heard that much about everyone that comes in should get one of these liquid biopsies every year. What's the current recommendations? Tell our audience what they should be thinking about, whether they should be discussing with their doctor, and can they just go to their primary care doctor and say, I want a liquid biopsy test for cancer? Yeah, so that's a great question. And I think that's the hardest part is how often, you know, and what is the psychological kind of downstream effects, right, of being told you have a cancer that you can't even locate and things like that. The way it was studied initially and a couple of studies have come out that were rather large on the utility and accurateness, they looked at getting these tests in a certain setting. And that was when the patient knew something was wrong. The doctor felt like something was wrong, couldn't explain the weight loss, couldn't explain why someone feels just generally unwell. And the workup has been pretty comprehensive. And if cancer was in the suspicion of, of, of a diagnosis, for example, for this reason, and you can't see it anywhere, those were the settings where they said, well, I think there is, I can't find it, let's do this test. Because remember, 
if you get it just shooting in the dark and you don't have symptoms, it just means you didn't have cancer today. It doesn't mean that you won't have cancer in three months. Yeah. But in those settings, it turned out that when it was positive, that led to further diagnostic things that you wouldn't be able to just cover a screening and often located that you know malignancy or cancer or prompted a very close examination soon thereafter to where you can see it when it's quote unquote large enough to then do something about it. And so these aren't used in lieu of traditional screening tests, mammogram, colorectal screening, um, you know, CT scans for smokers. This is a different subset of patients, not the general population that you come in and say, I want a yearly blood test for cancer. That's not its current usage. You had mentioned these are looking for gene fragments in a sense, in, in terms of an abnormal cell versus a normal cell. And people are used to the concept of genetic tests like 23andMe, where they're looking at sputum for inherited mutations. Talk to us about how the genetic tests like 23andMe are very different than these liquid biopsy tests in terms of what they're looking for and what they can tell a patient. Absolutely. And that's a very important point because when you were talking about genetics, unfortunately, genetics means a lot of things. All of that that you just said is genetics. But people think of genetics and checking for a genetic risk of cancer as a hereditary. And so there is a family history. You right. you get it from history. father or mother or, or grandparents. Yeah. You got it. Something that someone inherited from their parents that is present in all of their cells, a predisposition of sorts. That is an inherited hereditary cancer risk. So when you talk about BRCA1, BRCA2, right? These things where you take 23 and me and say, do I have a mutation? Was I born with one? right? In all of my cells that predisposes me to cancer. That is what- To you're certain types of cancers, correct? We're types. only looking at certain types. And it's actually a small number correct. overall. Yeah. Of all the cancers that are diagnosed, maybe 10 to 15% have something to do with a mutation that you had when you were born. If there was truly a cancer gene, then anyone that had that gene inherited, the cancer rate would be 100%. And there's nothing like that. There's nothing that we know of that says, if you have this, you have a 100% chance of having cancer. That in itself should tell you, wait, there must be something about cancer that is more than just your hereditary, you know, inherited genes, like uh, grow and die, right? They all kind of repopulate. When you are doing a blood draw, you're checking to see the evidence of inside those cells that have died, your good ones, your bad ones, whatever it may be. Every time your heart pumps, it just flows all of those DNA contents of, of the destroyed cells. And it looks at those contents and it says, am I identifying mutations in the DNA of cells that are ascribed to be cancerous? And that's the flag. And that is a check to see if you have cancer. It has nothing to do with what you're inherited with. You're actually looking to see active DNA of cancer. Today, and that's an important distinction. You mentioned how the liquid biopsies are looking at potential cancer today not about 10 years in the future. And the 23andMe and other tests are looking at a small subset of cancers that are related to inherited mutations that you get from family that perhaps puts you at increased risk for certain cancers. So two very different things, um, but amazing technologies in terms of where we are today versus a few years ago. And they're going to continue to iterate. So we're not yet at that simple blood test that a doctor can draw and say, hey, you have cancer or you don't. It's, it's still based on a, a certain population that may have um, some signs and symptoms that can't quite find an imaging that can allow you know, for more diagnostic testing. But as you point out, sometimes that can create a challenge where you can't find a cancer and you've been told you have cancer. How do you deal with that, Dr. Chineja? That That's... That's the question, in my opinion, you know, in an ideal world, in an ideal world, mm -hmm. if the liquid biopsy was inexpensive, it cost 10 cents, then sure, everyone could get a liquid biopsy every month and you would catch it the earliest, right? But the cost is one of the issues. But secondly, what do you do if you know it comes back saying you have lung cancer, but when you get the best modern technology to look at your lungs, there just isn't enough cancer there yet to be able to like do something about it. 
And that's the challenge. And there's actually, if you want to have a whole nother episode on what imaging modalities are coming out to be able to maybe see things a lot sooner than just glorified pictures. CT scans and MRIs are glorified pictures, right? So we're finding ways to be able to find and locate things at a much smaller degree. And that would be, I think, the next step. But it is distressing and it'll probably prompt more imaging that hopefully will be approved at that moment uh, to be able to locate something. Dr. Janejo, what do you say to a patient today who's concerned about cancer? They, They haven't been told that they have cancer but they're just concerned. They just don't feel right. What's your advice to listeners? I say for sure, be your biggest advocate. You have got to go in and one, have a detailed explanation on why you don't feel well. And if somebody just says, oh, you're fine, there are certain parameters to be able to justify why one may think that on your lab work, on the appropriate imaging. So I would ask for that. I would say, what are the things that support um, the conclusion that I do not have a cancer this time. And Should they course, do one of these tests? They can do one of these tests. If they are, if they are, you know, very concerned, you can talk to your physician. Now the cost is an issue. It's not something that's covered yet. It's not insured, uh, approved either. So, but obviously psychological distress is invaluable in my opinion. And you can elect for that if your provider is agreeable. And if not, maybe you could, you know, find a provider that, that feels kind of the same sentiment and you can obtain tests like this. But I'll tell you one thing. Everyone is concerned about cancer, but there's a lot of stuff coming out, and don't let someone tell you differently, where diet and lifestyle and stuff can help reduce those risks and modify that. And that's important that I think we underserve our population on being able to provide uh, how significant that is. If you have a family history, it could be because there's a lot of diabetes, which we know causes cancer, and not necessarily a cancer risk gene. So those are all those factors that can kind of blurry the picture on saying, oh, I must have a cancer gene. Well, it could be that a lot of people mm-hmm. in your in your family have diabetes and you know these kind of things that we uh, know also increase your risk. And we need to remind uh, viewers, we don't do these tests in lieu of currently recommended screening guidelines. Uh, you started a new group called Med Influencers. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so Med Influencers, these are the kind of bits of information and education we want to empower patients with because unfortunately, and I'm embarrassed about this as a medical provider in our healthcare system, there is a varying degree of how much education patients get. If the things ordered are ordered appropriately for screening, patients do have to be kind of empowered to some degree or their biggest advocate. And with Medfluencers, we're trying to provide that by having you know creators in every specialty share these updates, share these things to speak, talk to your doctor about, uh, and kind of equip you with the things to, to take the best overall you know, care of your health. Dr. Janaja, thanks for joining me today. Of course. Thank you for having me. And um, hopefully, you know, people find this information valuable and, and seek that information and education from their doctors. Mm-hmm.